Hey everybody, Ryan here with Plakeside Studios. Welcome back to Pedalhead. Today, we are taking a fairly exhaustive look at some of the original circuits that would kick off a whole new craze of clipping and distortion design in the late 70s and early 80s. You might call them the three amigos of the classic hard clippers with the MXR Distortion Plus, the Proco Rat, and everybody's favorite, Boss Distortion DS1. On this series alone, and that doesn't even include videos outside the series, we have talked to absolute death about soft clipping. The various ways you can tune the clipping profile, what it sounds like, what it looks like on a waveform analysis, how pedal designers make some soft clipping overdrives more transparent than others, how you can change the clipping structure based off of what solid state components you use, the effect of adding a boost stage before versus after the primary clipping part of the circuit, blending in a clean signal, how you can change the sound dramatically by changing how much bass you filter out before or after you hit that clipping signal, the effect of the tone stack, all that sort of stuff we have talked about in depth. And having a working knowledge of that terminology and those circuit mechanics will be valuable coming into this video because a lot of the same tricks apply. You'll see a lot of the same circuit path repeated throughout all these pedals and with the soft clipping stuff in general. But if you didn't watch all that stuff or you're coming into this fresh, I will try to recap as much of this as possible without being too redundant. So a few quick things to get out of the way before I get started here. First of all, none of the pedals I'm showcasing today, except for one at the very end, is of the vintage variety. These are all reissues or the modern versions of these circuits that you can go to sweetwater.com and buy brand new or reverb and, and find you know dozens of them in the $40 to $70 range, basically guaranteed. And of course, there's going to be people out there that go, well, you, you got to have the white face rat. You have to have the original big box. You have to have the, you know, the original MXR distortion plus they all, they sound different. They're just better circuits. Yes, no. Um, first of all, most of the differences people hear is probably going to come down to component drift or different clipping elements used all together because of supply issues. Now we either can't get those or they're discontinued, whatever. So you're no longer looking at it, the apples to apples comparison anyway. And oftentimes with these older versions of these kind of pedals, they're using, you know, etched circuit boards versus PCBs and through hole components versus surface mount components, big tin can op amps versus the integrated circuit op amps you'll find on these. And people are going to swear up and down that that LM308 and that classic rat, it just sounds better. It's definitely different. And uh, that's just objectively not true. <laughs> Be my guest if you want to buy a thousand dollar pedal. Um, but I would recommend you buy the $50 used version that sounds 100% identical and is probably going to be quieter. So this, there you go. Yeah, that is a comparison scientific analysis on an audio precision unit. One line is blue. It's the 007, and, uh, the OP07, and the other is the LM308. And that's the differences in them. I'm sorry, you said there's uh, two lines there? There's two different lines there? You saying there's two different lines? There's on the paper. I can't. Here's another knob minute, setting. Wait. Another knob setting. Where Just, is it? Because you have two to do lines? this. Hold on, hold on. Wait. Do you guys see the two lines? Do you see it or uh, not? Yes or no? I don't see the two lines. That means they're the same. Even factoring out differences in potentiometer tolerances, are you bound to find that a DS1 manufactured in this country five years ago was different than one manufactured 30 years ago in Japan? Yeah, it's likely. But 
Could you modify the new one to sound almost identical to the old one or even just turn the knobs a little bit more to match it? More than likely. I don't think you should sweat these kind of details versus some of the other components in your guitar rig, which is why I'll be talking about these pedals as a circuit, more from that standpoint than the individual revisions. Secondly, I know many of you out there enjoy the VST plug-in side of things, especially the free stuff. And if you're a try before you buy kind of person like me and you want to hear how some of these pedals sound in front of a familiar amplifier tone, and especially with a familiar guitar, and you'll really like this because for basically all these circuits, you can find a free representation of it in the VST world. I think there's some that are better than others, but for the most part, you can find something that's comparable. With the Distortion Plus, there's this DTQ Plus distortion that even has a tweak page that will allow you to induce a lot of the modifications that I'll be talking about with all these pedals, which is really cool. You have Nimbrini's Black, for the RAT, there's also the TSC R47, which I think sounds fantastic. And in fact, I think does a better representation of the RAT past noon than this one does. I like them both for different reasons though. And then for the DS1, we have the DS1 by Mercurial. This one is actually integrated into Antbox, which I think you actually need to purchase something to get that for free. There are other definitely 32-bit versions of the DS1 out there you can find. Didn't look too far for a 64-bit since I already had this, but if you're absolutely diehard about finding some type of circuit representation in a VST form, it's probably out there. So give that a shot before you drop what is otherwise a not terribly significant amount of money on this stuff, but still wouldn't hurt. Third, in lieu of my usual waveform and frequency response analysis, I'm just going to defer to Electra Smash on this one and, and totally rip them off and show you their analysis instead, because I'm not going to be able to do a better job than this. Uh, they've got each of the circuit diagrams broken up into individual nodes, in which they have different waveform analysis and you know frequency responses at different points in the circuit. I've referenced their charts before in the past. This time, I'm just gonna let them handle this one. So all credit goes to the original authors and contributors to these articles. Definitely check that stuff out if you want an even deeper dive, though you might wanna give it a little bit because right now I'm getting a security warning for their certificate of authenticity when I go there on Chrome. So you know, play that one safe. Hopefully that's not a issue going forward because they have a lot of great analysis there. And then finally, all the pedals you see sitting before you are mine. I paid for them out of pocket with my own money and all the opinions I'm displaying in this video are of my own. This is not sponsored. The caveat there is two of these pedals were sold to me well under MSRP. I guess you could call it the press pre-release beta tester discount as uh, they are prototypes. So I was uh, kind of exchanging my time to give some feedback to the pedal designer. And with that, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat my opinions on it or anything, but it's something you should be aware of. Regardless, huge thanks to Bionic Audio for reaching out and seeing if I wanted to try these circuits out. As you'll no doubt find, a lot of the same classic DNA exists in Bionic Audio's pedal designs, both for their released products and the unreleased ones. We'll probably talk about this one later on, but uh, definitely like to revisit it. So with that, let's finally get going on the classic hard clipping story. Looking into the early history of guitar pedal designs, particularly of fuzzes and overdrives and distortions, you can kind of draw some parallels between it and like the aviation industry or the automobile industry to a certain extent, where a lot of the gains made in those first 10 years were minuscule compared to what happened in only two or three years a decade or two later. The technology was in its infancy when we're talking about, you know, the fuzz faces or the treble boosters, and oftentimes designers are trying to make something work or make a sound to replicate something far more complicated. And they didn't really even know why it sounded that way, but they knew this circuit and this configuration made that sound. And they knew they could truncate some frequencies here and, and get it closer. Like a supercharged rotary engine, they could take some of the already aging technology at the time and slam a few gain stages together and get some pretty gnarly effects out of it. But as technology evolved and something like the operational amplifier was invented, the game changed practically overnight. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the operational amplifier was to audio equipment and guitar pedal design what the jet engine was to the aerospace industry. Within a few years of it being mass produced, 
you saw the entire designs of pedals flip on their head with 1977 seeing the release of the first soft clipping pedal, the Boss OD2. One. Of course, shortly thereafter, Ibanez came out with the symmetrical version with a tone knob, the famous tube screamer. And then just another year later, from 1978 to 1979, we saw all of these pedal circuits released on the market. Now, having so many similar products released in such a tight time window does beg the question, were these guys just like stealing designs off of each other? Was there some corporate espionage going on? And no, no, I don't think so. It's been practically confirmed by a lot of the people who have been interviewed at these various companies at the time that these pedals were released. Uh, they read the spec sheets. They're all getting very similar devices to power these pedals, the operational amplifiers, the silicon diodes, and there's only so many ways to skin this proverbial cat. So it's no wonder that you end up with very similar looking circuit topologies, and yet they can end up sounding so different. I think the most common example of uh, infighting, the ones that people just can't get the story straight on whether one pedal came first or the other, was the MXR Distortion Plus and the very similar, in fact, basically the same circuit, DOD OD250. But by all official accounts, it seems that the MXR Distortion Plus was out on the market beforehand. It began development beforehand. And several months later, the OD250 was more of a response to that with some tweaked component values and different clipper options. And now you have this, you know, very tightly knit story between those two pedals in particular. And that Distortion Plus OD250 example really highlights the point I was trying to make in the beginning of this video, where people get caught up in the, well, the, the OD250 gray spec sounds better than the yellow, and the vintage MXR sounds way better than this one. Here's the deal. There was no gray spec OD250. The gray spec was whatever they had laying around at the shop at the time. If they couldn't get these particular type of diodes, they switched to a different type of diode that was close enough, maybe measured a few millivolts differently, and maybe the input capacitor over here that filters some of the bass roll off is within 15% of the other one, so it's going to shift the frequency a little bit, but, you know, whatever. We got to make some units, and we can't get our supply straightened out. It was the late 70s, early 80s. You built what you got. With the exception of Boss, all of these early hard clippers were built by a team of three to 10-ish people. You know, MXR was just a, a few dudes, <laughs> Proco, not much bigger than that, making way more equipment than just the pedals. So they're gonna build with the supply that they had. So if you hear someone talking absolute nonsense about, well, this, you know, op amp always sounds better than this one, and this, range of pedals always has this fizzy distortion and high end that is far inferior to this one, which has a tighter low end. And it's all because of this particular magical silicon diode and its chakras are aligned because this one particular guy was wearing this shirt color standing on this workbench when he built it. You can more than likely find whatever different components there are on that circuit board, flip them out for something that's closer and you're not gonna be able to tell the difference. So what then is the Distortion Plus circuit? Well, here it is, and uh, that's, that's all. <laughs> it has a component count that is more in line with some of the simpler fuzz faces than even a stripped down Tube Screamer. And if you are somewhat familiar with a Tube Screamer circuit, you probably see some similarities, though you'll notice that about half of that circuit is missing because for this design, they only needed one operational amplifier to achieve the output level and the distortion quality they were going after. That means all of the gain, the clean signal boost, is actually built up in this part. You might have noticed that the distortion control is placed not too differently from where a Tube Screamer would have its gain control in this negative feedback loop. Usually it's further up this way, so it's going to impart a different effect on the frequency response. But what's more obvious is that it's completely missing those clipping diodes that impart the soft clipping effect at all. And the higher up you turn that gain control, the more distortion the diodes impart on that waveform's peak and trough. And you start to see it flatten out a little bit, but it's always more rounded than it is a square wave. And that is the definition of soft clipping. Yes, it is clipping. It's no longer reaching the threshold that it would have with clean amplification, and it's imparting harmonics and all that good stuff that distortion does. But it's a particular mode of clipping that never gets super aggressive. It's a little more static and compressed sounding, and a lot of people think of it as a decent way to emulate overdriven power amp tubes or even preamp tubes when they're just 
barely driven hard. This is pretty much the exact opposite of that philosophy. Instead of having the clipping diodes in that arrangement, they are actually shunted to ground at the output of the operational amplifier. Having the diodes in this configuration acts as much more of a hard limiter, letting damn near none of the signal pass its threshold pass through that part of the circuit. So if you slam the distortion control, all that gain going into that part of the circuit, you get nearly a square wave, though not a perfect square wave because number one, that doesn't exist in the analog world, but namely there's extra filtering going on before and in parallel to that distortion. So in addition to that mid hump that we see when you crank the distortion control, thanks to this kind of built-in tone stack behavior, there is also a capacitor in parallel to those diodes that help filter out some of that top end nastiness. Now you can change that if you wanted to round it out a little bit more in the frequency response, or you could theoretically get rid of it altogether if you wanted a really spitty, disgusting sounding pedal, but you'll often find that feeding a even clean, but especially crunchy or driven amplifier with a ton of frequency content past five or 10K is going to sound really bad. And the pedal designers knew that. So that's why you'll see for a lot of these hard clipping pedals, there are a ton of spots where the frequency response is being tailored to the next gain stage or even on the output stage, just like the Tube Screamer for that matter. But here, I feel like it is a uh, much bigger undertaking and is far more sensitive just because of the levels of distortion we're talking about. There's something else I want you to notice though about this output waveform, and that is on the lower distortion levels, it kind of resembles a soft clipping pedal, doesn't it? I mean, there's not a huge difference between that shape and something that you might see coming out of a tube screamer. And this kind of opens up a whole debate about, is it even necessary to go through a soft clipping design at all. If on the lower end of a pedal's gain range, you can have something that sounds sort of soft clipping like, and you know, you could of course make that asymmetrical as well if you change the diode configuration. But then on the higher end, you get something that's more square wave and harsh and you want a pedal to do both. Why not just go with the hard clipping configuration? In my opinion, I kind of think you should. And hopefully we'll make a case for that as we go on through the pedal stack here. Finally, you have the passive output control, which in this dime configuration will slam the front end of your amplifier with gobs of distortion and output around the seven to 800 Hertz range, though it starts to attenuate on both sides. I've yet to find an application where this makes sense though, and you'll often see me do something like this, where the higher distortion I go, the more I turn down the output volume, which sort of lines up with the way I might use a soft clipping pedal, though for a lot of soft clipping pedals, the overall distortion and output volume of the pedal doesn't really change with gain nearly as severely with this. When you're cranking distortion, you are really cranking the output frequency response as well in a filtered manner, of course. So at this point, some of you might be asking, where's the tone control? You know, Boss OD2 didn't have one. They kind of figured out a successor with the SD1 that did. So what, what about this guy? Well, in essence, the distortion control is your tone control. The more distortion you're pushing, the more mids you're pushing. And this is something that we kind of explored in the Blues Breaker video where they did more or less the same thing because to our ears, the more overdrive, the more distortion and harmonics that signal is producing, you actually need to attenuate the low and high end for it to sound balanced. So a highly distorted signal with kind of this mid hump sounds more in line to a lower distortion signal without it. Fletcher Munson and all that crazy stuff. The point being, I'm not sure that having a passive tone control that just cuts off the high end, which is basically what a lot of Tube Screamer stuff does, would really be valuable here anyway, because this was a conscious decision on the pedal's part. Now, there have been people that's gone back and added stuff to these circuits, and I, I don't know that they're very good sounding. I don't know if it's partially due to some impedance mismatching and tone sucking and that sort of thing. I would like to hear this circuit with like a passive bass and treble control if it worked, but again, you're making sacrifices at the output level, that sort of thing. If you really care about it, try a you know seven, six band EQ after the fact and, and give it a whirl. But I think with how simple this is all around, it's really not something that can be improved upon entirely without making it a whole new circuit anyway. 
Now the demonstration parts of this video start to get a little more subjective. So what do I think this pedal does well? Well, it's a distortion box, right? I mean, you should be able to do one of two things with it. You can either stick it in front of a clean channel and make this your entire distortion sound for leads or, you know, kind of a, a crunchy type of sound, or you can stick it in front of a already mildly driven kind of mid gain, say Plexi or 2204 style circuit and have a cascading thing where, you know, the, the amp's already sort of breaking up, but then you can hit it with some clean boost from the output and then dial up how much you know, silicon diode distortion you want out of this and, you know, consequently actually add some mid hump to it, which all around is actually the perfect package because it shaves off some of those problematic lows and highs you can run into when boosting those kind of amplifiers. I think because of that, that example is where this thing really shines. It's that Randy Rhodes, you know, late 70s, early 80s rock and roll kind of guitar sound when you use it in that subtle way, kind of dancing between the higher output and lower distortion settings. It's workable on the clean channels, but it's not great. And the reason I think that, especially when compared to comparable circuits, is the choice of clippers. So the originals especially use these 1N270 germanium diodes and if I've learned anything from my journey the past 10 years trying different distortion boxes is that germanium diodes in general are by far my least favorite. Now there's, you know, the, the Klon stuff and uh, some of the more transparent overdrives that make them work, you know, a really big fan of the Blues Breaker and the Klon circuits for what they do. But in terms of a standard hard or soft clipper, these things just can, can fuck right off as far as I'm concerned. I don't care for them much at all, but it is a defining sound of this. And if you're into it, that's great. For my money, it's a little too fuzzy. And if I want fuzz, I'll use a fuzz. Never fear though, just like with modified soft clipper circuits, if you like the fundamental architecture and the things that it does, but don't necessarily love the clipping aspect of it, you can absolutely find modified pedals out there or do it yourself if you prefer such a thing. This is one such example of what one can do with the Distortion Plus or OD250 circuit. This is more or less based off of a typical gray box OD250. Again, there's no real gray spec, just whatever people pick up and use as a reference. But on the bottom of this pedal, there's a three-way switch to toggle between a more traditional silicon diode setup. There's the germanium pair of diodes, more like the Distortion Plus, and I believe it's in the center that my favorite mode lies with the red LEDs. And as we've talked about with some of the previous modified hard and soft clipping pedals I've looked at, I think that is the most tube-like and natural because it, it has a bit of a higher headroom and the way that it distorts does remind me more of overdrive tubes for whatever reason. And I think a lot of pedal designers and even amp designers figured that out when they started putting them into some of their amp circuits. So here is kind of a, what you can expect across the spectrum, a different OD250 and MXR Distortion Plus tones. <laughs>
Let's say for the most part, you liked what you just heard there, but you're craving more. You know, that was, that was amateur hour. That was nowhere near as much gain and distortion and saturation. You're over there scratching and itching for something that's going to sound like your whole amp's about to have a nuclear meltdown. You're going to blow out your speakers. Well, enter the Bionic Audio Witch King. This is built off of the same platform as their already released Chimera, and it takes advantage of a nice little feature of modern chipset components in that when you buy an operational amplifier integrated circuit, you're usually buying a dual op amp. So with the MXR Distortion Plus circuit, you're only taking advantage of half of that chip, even on the modern production units. But as you might recall, all those famous soft clipping pedals used a dual op amp circuit. So what happens when you slam the two together? Well, you end up with the front end of a tube screamer with its gain control. You end up with the back end of an MXR Distortion Plus with a toggle for how much distortion is coming from that part of the circuit, be it 10% or 200%, the original design. You get a three band EQ that is far more powerful than you're gonna find on either one of those pedals individually, and of course, a passive output volume. And it's sorta of stonery, sludgy rock in a box. The Distortion Plus discussion filled out most of the concepts that you'll need for any hard clipping pedal. It's usually about how the clipping elements are reacting, what kind of frequency content you're feeding those clipping elements, how you're filtering the signal afterwards, which brings us perfectly into the Proco Rat. The first thing you're likely to notice besides the fat little square enclosure, which is a baby compared to the monstrous big box rats from 1978 and 1979, is that there's an additional control labeled filter. Now you might see this and go, okay, you know, I, I know what this is now. It's a, you know, a, a gain volume tone kind of thing, just like a uh, tube screamer. And indeed on some of the more conservative settings, you can kind of use this pedal as a tube screamer, but there are some subtleties that make this kind of a anti-tube screamer in some ways. And in my opinion, it's the most versatile, well-rounded, and if there is a best of category, I would say it's the overall best out of all of the classic hard clippers. A quick peek at the rat circuit unveils a topology that's not that different from the Distortion Plus, just with another small section crammed between the clipping stage and the output volume, which at full bore, with Distortion maxed out, will actually give you even more level than the Distortion Plus will. So if you want to really punish the front end of an amplifier, this one has even more output, distorted output, that is, level on tap. Taking a look at the clipping stage, Things, once again, are not too dissimilar. Some elements are moved around here and there, but you'll see the same sort of bias points and even some similarities in the overall filtering. But with where the distortion control and some adjacent resistor capacitor combinations are situated in the negative feedback loop of that op amp, you end up with a somewhat similarly bandpassed affair in the frequency response as you crank the distortion control, but it is much more peaky, as you see, when it's maxed out. So you're always kind of limited on the high end, but the low end slope is a lot less aggressive 
than that of the Distortion Plus. So you end up with a less even kind of hill of mid-frequency content around the 700 to 800 hertz region. And this one ends up pushing much more into the 1000 to 1100 hertz range and a more aggressive peak. An interesting consequence of this non-linear low end attenuation is that on the lower end of the distortion control, you end up with a rather contemporary looking frequency response. That is the low end below about 1000 hertz is really gently rolled off almost as if it were a low shelf cut. And then above that is sort of a high shelf boost relatively. And so you get kind of a tighter, more contemporary metal sound out of the lower distortion control than you would really expect. And I think this is probably one of my favorite setups is to have distortion in about nine o'clock or below. You got to get over the kind of the dead spot at the very low end of this and then use the rest as a, a clean boost setup, essentially. I think it sounds really cool. However, if you've got an amplifier with a really strong bright cap and it's letting a lot of high end bleed through, you might find that this is way too raspy and ice picky sounding and you need something to tame it. Or you're just a madman, you wanna crank the distortion to max, but you wanna have a big rumbly low end fuzz kind of texture. Well, that's where the filter control comes into play. Now, probably a lot of you see this and think, oh, you know, I, I know how this works already. Filter low is going to be, you know, kind of a, a more low end focus and then filter high is going to be, you know, high end focus, just like a, a tube screamer. Wrong. It used to be on the old rats, but human psychology wins out on this particular design because what do we guitarists like to do for a lot of our tone controls? Well, it's usually set to there or above, you know? Who's running a Marshall style lamp with the treble below five? You know, only Angus Young does that. And that's what Proco found a lot of guitar players did was just instinctually, I'm going to set it here on the filter control. Well, at the distortion settings that they were running, that ended up sounding a little harsh to a lot of people and they wrote the pedal off as useless and, you know, it's problematic because of it. But guess what? If you wire the potentiometer backwards, that setting is closer to this now. And well, oh, people like that. That's warm and organic sounding and analog. Oh, I really like that, even though all they could have done is just turn the knob the other way and achieve the exact same result on the old rats. But at the end of the day, that's why all contemporary rat pedals are wired such that filter minimized is the full frequency response and the further you turn it up, the more you attenuate the high end in a similarly gentle about six decibels per octave filter. So all the way up here, you're actually starting to cut frequencies as low as 300 hertz for its critical cutoff. So you're getting an extreme amount of high end attenuation, and that's why you can turn this thing into a utter fuzz box. And that's ultimately what makes this little package so potently versatile. You've got a wide open distortion stage that really filters out all the frequencies that aren't contributing to core guitar frequencies, tamed enough on the high end to where it doesn't sound overly scratchy and unbearable. But if you want to let most of it through, you can back off on the filter control. Or if you wanna have it be a big boomy fuzz box, you can cut all that high end, crank the distortion, slam the front end of your amp volume. Or if you're like me and wanna retain most of your amplifier's character, but just add a little bit of that saturation and strong pick attack of the clipping diodes, turn up the distortion a little bit, cut a little bit of the highs if you need to, and then use the rest of the passive output volume as a boost. What a fantastically underrated design. Of course, there are things that, you know, plenty of newer pedal companies have revised about this and have made objectively better. But as the granddaddy of all these other pedal designs, there's really not a whole lot I think that needs to be fixed about this. Sure, it has its quirks, but how many other hard clipping pedals can truly sound more or less like a clean boost on the lower end very crunchy, articulate, and preamp tube-like in their mid-range and full-blown fuzz, spitty, doomy sounding on the higher end of the distortion range. The Rad is a pedal modifier's best friend, even to Proco themselves, which is why they've released so many variations of this circuit over the past few decades, including a bass-specific one with a clean blend control. You have some absolutely out outrageous collaborations they've done with different resellers, but I think the best things they've done have been simply changing the clipping structure. 
of the main gain stage here, which you can find culminated into one package with some of these made overseas, very, very inexpensive pedals, such as the Little Bear uh, R Attack, Rat Attack RT2. This is a brand everybody knows, you know, just household name at this point. But on the equivalent setting of the regular Rat 2 I have, sounds basically identical. If you bought one of these or even uh, something like the Moore knockoff or the, the Moen pedal I've had before, you're going to be happy. But what I like about this is it combines three official Proco circuits into one, and you basically get all those sounds at the flip of a switch. Like I said, the vintage mode at the bottom is your basic bog standard silicon diode setup. On the top end, you have the you dirty rat version, which replaces those with germanium diodes. The output level drops fairly significantly. You get a spittier, fuzzier distortion texture throughout most of the control range here. And it's not my favorite, but I actually prefer this to a stock distortion plus. But once again, we see the red LEDs show up and you can actually see them this time, which is kind of cool. And the turbo mode, which the Turbo Rat was an official release where one of their in-house techs modified it to make it more amp-like in response. And they're one of those somewhat vague terms that I think turns out to be true here. It does meld very well as a sort of clean boost and, you know, adding kind of a tube-like gain stage in front of a, you know, say JCM 800 or aforementioned Plexi style circuits. So if you like the Rat for mostly what it does, but you want to get a different texture out of it, this is a very easy way to do it. You can find officially modded pedals everywhere or some sort of, you know, overseas manufactured knockoff like this that probably has most of that in one box.
Bionic Audio brought us a pretty monstrous Distortion Plus modified circuit. Let's see what they can do with the rat. The Desmodus is overall the same concept. You got the three band EQ at the end, the rat circuit in the middle this time instead of the Distortion Plus, but the plus and minus switch actually affects the circuit feeding the rat. At the minus position, it's more akin to a soft clipped Marshall Governor style circuit, which we'll talk about more in depth later. And then the plus side, thanks to a enormous capacitor in the negative feedback loop of that part of the op amp, is like a op amp big muff. So if you want to fuzz your fuzz, yo dog, uh, you know, that, that whole meme, that's what it does. We have one more pedal out of the classic trio, and this is almost without a doubt the most polarizing of the bunch, the Boss DS1. Now, I don't know about you younger whippersnappers that have started playing guitar in the past five or 10 years and have an abundance of cheap Chinese and Taiwanese made knockoffs that you can get on eBay or Amazon for, you know, south of $30, but if you were playing guitar in the 90s to mid 2000s, I'd bet dollars to donuts that one of the first true hard clipping distortion boxes you ever plugged into was a Boss DS1 because a lot of people bought them, they were everywhere, and they weren't what most people wanted them to be. And I think it's a bit of an unfair stigma that this pedal has garnered, but it also deserves some of the criticisms and at least one of the choices made on the circuit, I think is objectively not good for what they're going for. It doesn't help that this pedal underwent like three major revisions in the first 25 years of its production. And I certainly don't always subscribe to the, well, the earliest one's the best and you gotta spend a thousand dollars on a used black label for it to, to be a worthwhile product. But this one objectively doesn't sound great. Uh, the main and Taiwan versions that are the most popular like the one I have here, suffer from some fizz and not great distortion texture once you push it on the higher end, uh, though I don't think that's its biggest problem as we'll kind of explore later throughout here. But generally speaking, the rest of the circuit topology hasn't really changed. It's a boss pedal. You're going to have the really nice discrete buffer before and after the signal you know, you want your true bypass, it's fine. You can buy different versions that have that. And in general, the different tone shaping stages and clipping arrangement hasn't really changed, but you know, you heard how significant of a difference you can get with just changing the types of diodes used in a pedal. So you can expect something along that line if you're going to be comparing one from 1980 to one that you bought last week, simple as that. So the DS1, is by far the most complicated of these original circuits, implementing not just one side of an op amp, but both sides of a dual op amp, if you're you know, on one of the more contemporary versions, or two tin cans, if you got an older one. Additionally, that dual op amp circuit is being pushed by a transistor gain stage, and kind of a dirty one at that. That doesn't even include the JFETs in the buffer, which are kind of at unity. This one has a bit of asymmetrical distortion, somewhat like you'd hear out of a Boss Super Overdrive. Cutting the lows of the incoming signal around 300 hertz and absolutely slamming it with 35 decibels of not so symmetrical, not so clean transistor boost already kind of defines the character of this pedal before we even got to the hard clipping stage, which is 
controlled by the distortion control. It's, it's kind of like having an always on dirty treble boost in front of one of these pedals. You can only do so much after the fact and I think it lends itself to being a not so dynamic pedal. Um, you can even see that in both the waveform analysis and the frequency response where even at its lower end of the distortion control, it's always kind of hard clipped and more compressed looking than even the Proco Rat at some of the higher settings. Its output frequency response doesn't really change all that much with higher distortion, just proportionally cutting lows a little more as you turn up the control, but the highs mostly remain intact, just slightly attenuated past about 3000 Hertz to chop off some of the harshness. So you can see between those things that they were really kind of looking at this as a two or three gain stage, mid gain to high-ish gain amplifier platform in a box before that was even a thing, which I think is very forward looking and really cool, but the overall execution of it maybe wasn't quite up to the standards we're used to today. And because it is so flat looking and because it wasn't designed with this one-stop shop boost, cut, distortion type of mentality that the previous pedals were, then you end up with the platform that I think you kind of need something up front if you're going to put this into a clean channel to really get that rock guitar sound without anything else in the equation. Could it probably work for a regular distorted lead if you're playing on a pop record? Sure. But for the type of dynamic picking response and tube articulation that we're probably expecting out of a pedal like that nowadays, this might fall a little short unless you put something in front of it to help it out. That alone, I think, is not a big deal. But somebody pissed in the proverbial punch bowl at Boss because they left us with this tone control, which is, it's not good, guys. This is really, <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. A common mantra running among the players who are still brave enough to play a Boss DS1 is to never run the tone control above noon. In fact, run it a little below just in case the pot tolerances is you know closer to plus 20% than minus. And there's a good reason for that, because on the lower end of the tone control, it looks very much like a Proco Rat with the filter, you know, on the higher end. You got some, you know, not so steep attenuation past around the 300 hertz range and put that into a relatively bright, clean channel and it might work out just fine for you. Turning up the tone control, though, starts to bring in more high end in a way that looks more like a high shelf or especially an amplifier's tone sack control more than it does a passive high cut like you'd see with the Rat or one that's wired kind of backwards with a Tube Screamer. And I think this is yet more evidence that Boss was looking at this as an amp channel in a box kind of platform. And that's all well and good up until you get around noon. At that point, the high end content past about 2000 Hertz and the low end content below about 300 is mostly balanced. And we've started to develop this mid scoop, which if you're playing in front of a really honky mid heavy clean channel, probably sounds fine. But as you start turning up that tone even more, the midpoint starts to shift a little bit down to around 250, 275 Hertz and your low end is here and your high end is way up here. And it becomes so incredibly nasally and box of pissed off B sounding that it only reminds me of those little drill tools that the dentist used to really get in there and makes your entire jaw and brain vibrate. That's what this sounds like to me, above noon. You turn the tone control down, and especially if you were to add some post EQ after it, you can actually get some really decent amp-like sounds with an appropriate distortion setting. But my God, that tone control is something to behold. Now, it's not totally useless, it is for most people, but if you're going for some crazy sounds, some chainsaw-like super fuzz, you know, hybrid HM2 stuff, you can turn everything to max, slam it in front of an already high gain amplifier and get some wild textures out of it, but most people aren't gonna play it that way. That's why if you're going to use a distortion circuit like this, a lot of people will go to the mod scene, find stuff that either, you know, JHS is modded into a, a synth-like sound or the classic Keeley stuff, or you can go to this design, which has now reached full circle, where MXR is modding a boss design, even though they got there first with hard clipping, kind of, kind of crazy. <laughs> but this, in essence, is a boss DS1 circuit with one major revision. Can you guess what it is? It's a clipping mod. Yay! 
Besides blinding you with what feels like a 50 megawatt blue LED, this crunch switch engages a different type of clipping diodes on the output stage of the clipping section, just like you would expect on something like the RAT or the aforementioned uh, OD250 mod. And I think it is better. It's subtle, but it's, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. And with it off, you can absolutely get a damn near comparable sound to what the DS1 can produce. So if you like having kind of a boutique-ified version of a lot of standard effects, this isn't a bad place to start with the DS1, but I think the gains are minimal, especially compared to what we saw on the previous circuits, and it's why this absolutely goes in last place for me on the classic hard clipping section. It's not a bad circuit topology. People have done really nice things with it. I just think they flew a little too close to the sun on this attempt at an amp in the box, though you gotta give them credit for trying it before basically anyone else did. Um, but there's certainly learnings to take away from that, such as a three band EQ or even just a bass and treble control would have been really nice. Um, having maybe not so much of your distortion on one gain stage and then you know having basically zero range in your distortion control, things like that. But I think this was absolutely a pivotal moment in distortion design, in guitar pedals, and a, a lot has sprung forth from the learnings on this pedal. So you're a pedal designer in the 1980s. Where do you go from here? Well, maybe you're a pro co and you figure out like we showed that if you just change your clipping diodes, you can get some wildly different sounds with the same sort of circuit. You know, we're still clipping the integrated circuit, that op amp quite a bit, so we still have our own flavor going on, but you know, here's a different version of the rat with this type of diode versus the, you know, the red LEDs or the silicon diodes. You could be an MXR and look to what, you know, TC Electronics doing and say, oh, well, you know, they were able to delete the distortion out of their circuit and you get a little bit of op amp compression and dirt when you push the volume high there. 
Let's do the same thing. Let's make a version of this that doesn't have the clipping diodes, make it a little flatter, and voila, we've got the microamp, and heck, we can throw a bass and treble control on a plus version of that down the road. Or you can be boss and say, eh, let's throw in every type of transistor boost and op amp gain stage and hard clipping section and soft clipping section and gyrators and some crazy ass EQ curves and a lot of output and see what happens. That's going to have to wait, though, for a content piece that will be far in the future. In the closer, more near future, I hope to return on this topic with some of those late 80s, mid 90s, early 2000s contemporary hard clippers before we look at some of those things that combine, say, a hybrid clipping solution. So if you'd like to join me on that future content piece, I hope to see you there. I hope you got some information out of this one. Once again, big thanks to Bionic Audio for letting me uh, test ride these things before they were out. Um, I'll link their website somewhere if you want to go check them out. They're a pretty cool alternative to what we've shown here, but you know, you just want to get into hard clippers. If you're tired of your tube screamer, check one of these out. But as I said before, my number one suggestion would be some plain Jane Proco Rat, the Rat 2, the Little Rat, whichever form factor you like, or some contemporary version of that that's built off of that circuit, whether it's, you know, some Chinese made special that has all the clipping modes or um, something like a Wampler uh, Rat's Bane. I think Walrus Audio has one. See which one fits you the best. Don't sneeze on the uh, OD250 circuit. If you can find one with multiple modes like this for relatively low cost, it's not bad. This one's weird in that uh, the input is on this side and the output's on that side, but it's about the only complaint I have about this one. And um, you know, if you find a DS1 on the sidewalk or in front of the dumpster at your local guitar center, then yeah, maybe plug it in, see what happens. But I don't think you're gonna love it, just a guess. Any other questions, comments, or suggestions, leave them down below, and we will see you next time on Pedalhead. Thanks. Bye.